afternoon, everyone. How are you all? I hope you all have had a beautiful week. And you know, what a wonderful day it is to be studying the Haftarah together today. So with that in mind, let's get straight into this. So I'm actually going to ask Norma, can you kindly lead us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we just thank you and we bless and praise and glorify your holy name. We just thank you for your anointing on Kelly this morning, this afternoon, and pray that our ears and our hearts will be open to receive all that you've got for us. And um, as King Solomon said, we need to listen and we need to learn and grow. And I just pray that over us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Norma. That's wonderful. Well, we are in week 45, so we are drawing nearer and nearer to the Torah cycle end for the year, which is exciting. But the name of the portion that we will be studying this week is Va'echanan, which means I pleaded or I besought. And, uh, you know, this portion is actually uh, very special to me because this was the very first portion I actually taught. So today I have the privilege of being able to share with you the Haftarah portion uh, and uh, a side of things given that uh, a couple of years ago I did the Torah portion, which was fantastic. Anyway, like all the Torah portions uh, that we read, uh, the portion title name, as I said, which is Vahek Hanan, is located in the first verse of the Torah portion reading. And given that Vahek Hanan means I pleaded, this is where we see uh, Moses starting to plead to God to get access into the promised land. He's asking for God to show favour, to be gracious to him, because at this point, we know that the children of Israel are actually on the eastern side of the Jordan River, excuse me, nearly ready to cross over. And as we know, Moses has previously been told he cannot cross to go into the promised land. So the Torah portion study continues in the book of Deuteronomy, specifically Deuteronomy 3, chapter 3, verse 23, through to chapter 7, verse 11. But for us today, looking at the Haftra, we are continuing our study in the book of Isaiah. And so for those that were on last week with Michelle, you may remember uh, you guys focused literally on chapter one of Isaiah, which was a really great study, uh, something that I got to watch afterwards. Uh, but however, we're actually going to be sitting in the book of Isaiah today and then, of course, continuing on for another six weeks. But we're actually going to be looking at the back half of the book of Isaiah. So because we are continuing our study in Isaiah, we continue to stay in the same period of time as last week, and that is between 740 and 670 BCE. So I'm just going to throw this up on the screen for you like I do um, to give you a perspective. All right. So here we can see Isaiah right through the middle. And then, of course, we're in the time. Actually, Isaiah was down here a little bit more. Some of these are slightly out. We often find with some of the timelines, they're not all exactly the same. But Isaiah was actually down in this area. But this is where we're sitting between this period of time. So pretty much uh, smack bang in the page there by the look of it. Uh, but between 740 and around 670 uh, BCE. All righty. I'll stop my share. Just get back to my notes. All righty. So this portion that we are studying, obviously uh, Isaiah's prophecy, is actually shifting gears and moving into a series of consolations. So the key theme we are focusing on both today and in the coming weeks 
is on comfort. Now, there's a reason for this, and I will elaborate a little bit more um, in a minute, but I just want to remind you where we are sitting in terms of the two kingdoms. So in this period of time, there is definitely the two kingdoms, the northern and the southern kingdom, otherwise known the northern kingdom as Samaria and the southern known as Judah or the northern known as Israel is another name for it. And the southern, and, and at this stage, um, the northern kingdom has actually been taken over by the Assyrian Empire. And so the southern kingdom is still standing. So we're going to read through the scripture now. Let's quickly open up to quickly Isaiah 40 verses 1. And it does go through to 26. But Vanessa, if you can kindly read Isaiah 40 verse 1 and just take it to the end of verse 5, please. So was it Isaiah 40, 40? 1 to 5? Yes, thank you. So it's comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all the flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Lovely. Thank you, Vanessa. Appreciate that. So as you know, the key questions that Michelle and I asked when we started the Haftarah is how does the Haftarah portion link to the Torah portion? And it's important because it's a supplement reading to the Torah portion, isn't it? And I'm sure of those that have been studying the Haftarah for a while can see how beautifully, you know, the, this thread is sewn through the Bible, um, the Tanakh, and um, from the Torah through to the prophets of Neverim and, of course, into Kedavim, the writings, and then on into the gospel, the gospel, the gospel and the New Testament. And as I mentioned a fortnight ago, every Haftarah is linked to the Torah, but according to the Jewish rabbis, the last 10 weeks of the Torah cycle year actually doesn't have these clear links. And um, so does that mean to say there's no links at all? No, I don't believe so. But the intention by the rabbis, however, when they're putting this together for the last 10, 10 weeks was that there is no intentional link so why is this why is that well you may remember a fortnight ago when uh, i was online on hafter i talked about the fact that there are actually well, at that time we were actually in the second week of the three weeks of rebuke or admonition or reprimand and the portion um uh, they, they chose the portions then according to uh or should I say they, they, in that three weeks, they wanted to acknowledge and remember the destruction of the first and second temple. Do you guys remember this, that, how I was talking? Yeah. So the Jewish people would fast on the 17th of Tamaz and the 9th of Az, Av. So can any of you guys remember what month Tamaz and Av were in the Gregorian calendars? It's pretty, pretty straightforward. I think we're sitting in one already. <laughs> Yes, Beth. Is it Avs? Pardon? Avs? Or, or is that the, um, the time we're in? Yeah, no, you're um, right with Avs. So what, what month does that fall? Like, mm. Would it be July or August? Yeah, it's exactly right. We're living in it at the moment. So Tamaz is either June, July. And Av is either July or August. And that is because depending on the how the Jewish year fell. Um, when we look at Tamaz in the Hebrew year, counting from Aviv, it's the fourth month. Tamaz is the fourth month and Av is the fifth month. So just a little bit of rehash on <laughs> what we've talked about before. Now, Michelle last week actually finished the third and final week of the three weeks of rebuke. But if you want to know more about that, those that are re-watching this and haven't watched uh, what the rebukes are about and what the whole premise behind it is, then jump back and have a look at the episode on the Torah portion of Matat Masai, which is week 42 and 43, and I explain it more back there. 
So this way, as I said, we see this abrupt shift in the readings. Uh, there's no more rebuke. Rather, now we see Isaiah's words and prophecies, as remember, this is God's words, all about comfort and consolation. And these readings of consolation um, covers things like uh, the return from exile. And this is this is happening over the next few weeks, not just today, but over the next uh, six weeks apart from today. Uh, the restoration of Zion, the messianic kingdom here on earth. And then, of course, there is this talk of this representative of redemption through the use of the word of the servant of the Lord. So we'll be exploring that between myself and Michelle with you guys, uh, all these uh, prophecies of comfort. So these three weeks and seven weeks of convers I keep going to say conversations, it's consolations <laughs> make up this 10-week period that I mentioned. And then, of course, we then head into the spring festivals and the first one being Rosh Hashanah, which is very fitting uh, to, to finish, obviously, um, the year off. But one thing I do want to clarify, and I don't think I mentioned it when I talked about uh, it so, you know, a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about the three weeks of rebuke. And that is that this 10-week period is not actually an appointed festival that we see outlined in Leviticus 23. It is something that the Jewish people have chosen to remember. And that is based on Zechariah 8.19. And I mentioned it last um, in that episode a couple of weeks ago, and I will bring it up a little bit later. But I think it's important for us to note this. And the reason why, or at least just, you know, acknowledge this is because this is why we're reading the Haftarah portion. And it gives a purpose as to why they chose the Haftarah portions for this 10-week period. So one of them, do you guys have any thoughts of, like I said, there wasn't any intentional link that the rabbis have put to the Haftarah portion today, but uh, for those that have read both the Torah and the Haftarah, can you guys see any intentional or unintentional links that you can see between the two portions? Uh, Kelly, I was just going to say um, this, uh, this week is special to the Jews. It's called some name. It starts with H or something. Okay. But I huh? Oh, I'm yes, but I understood you. it's only for this week. It's about the temples and all that, yeah, and it's sort of like in mourning or whatever it is, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Glenna. So, um, it, uh, it probably was that ending of the three weeks of rebuke that you're talking about. I think it, it was called Tisha Av or something like that, but it might be another name that I'm not aware of. Um, but, yeah, yeah, and now we go into this period of comfort. So they're out of exile and in exile and we start kind of talking about comfort. But sounds like you're all over it, Glennis, with uh, your readings as well. <laughs> and, yeah, Beth. Uh, Kelly, the link I thought of was yep. just that. The, uh, the Israelites were preparing to come out of their years in the wilderness and Moses was really going over the years, reminding them of different things that had, had happened, warning them again about idolatry yep. and um, so too, I thought with the Haftarah, these people have been in captivity for, for years and he's comforting them and, you know, they're probably getting anxious about uh, maybe they have talked about coming out of captivity and they would be, um, you know, looking forward and excited, I believe, because there would, would be many people that um, didn't even live in Israel. They were born in captivity. So that was the link I thought of. Yeah, I mean, and I think you've nailed it, Beth, because that was the same thing I was thinking, you know, like um, he's going over these words of, I mean, they have the God of the universe looking after them. <laughs> and, you know, yes, okay, there's things that they need to follow and that, but they they have the God of the universe looking after them. And I think it was in um, Deuteronomy 7, maybe it was around 5 or 6, where he calls them his treasured and he's comforting them with these beautiful words. You 
you know, you're mine, you're my treasure, I love you. And so I thought that was, uh, you know, in, in just adding on to what Beth said, that that beautiful comforting, um, given that we're in this series of comfort, that there was this link uh, that tied them together as well. Did anyone have any other thoughts before I move on? Lovely. Well, another link that isn't as obvious uh, and this is the reason for this is if you read the rabbi's commentary on it, <laughs> it comes up there. So if you were to jump on Safari and uh, and you were to click on the first verse of uh, this portion, which is Isaiah 40 verse one, uh, you'll see what Rabbi Ibn Ezra has to say. And he actually uh, refers to this second of this chapter 40 and the, the start of verse one as a, the second part of the book of Isaiah. Now, just in reference to what Michelle said last week, she made a point of this actually, uh, where she said, you know, the rabbi said that the Isaiah has been broken down into two clear distinctions. Others actually say it's more, uh, but these two sections are broken down from chapters one to 39 and that is considered as book one and chapters 40 to 66, which is like book two. And, uh, and of course, book two covers these consolations and um, messianic hope prophecies and, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff, which we're going to delve into today. Uh, but some of the biblical academics uh, refer to the second half of the book of Isaiah as Deutero Isaiah. So I'm sure you could probably start seeing where I'm coming from here. Um, in other words, they're saying it's a second Isaiah. And some actually allude that it actually has been written by someone completely different. Whether that's true or not, you know, I, I'm, I'm not supporting that necessarily. I'm just saying this is what they say uh, because of this acute shift in, um, in prophecy. So this, the link that I see here is really just in this word Deutero, meaning second. Um, and can anyone remember what Deuteronomy means? I've said part of it already. Uh, it's all the laws and statutes, isn't it? Yeah, so Deutero is second and Nomos is law. That's perfect, Glennis. So it's just a repeat. And I know Isaiah is not saying or talking about the second law, but, however, there is this, you know, second instalment of writing in Isaiah. But what I did find interesting is when I was reading uh, or studying some of First Fruits of Zion's literature, they had the following that I'm just going to read to you to say, which I think it's actually a really good little um thought on it, significant thought on it. So was Jutro Isaiah written by a different author, author than the one who wrote the first 39 chapters? Many scholars suppose so. The two author theory is plausible, but the apostolic community, so we're talking about the times um, of Messiah, did not acknowledge a distinction between the 39, first 39 chapters and the rest of Isaiah. They ascribed the entire scroll to Isaiah, the son of Amos. So they believed that Isaiah wrote the whole lot. The Qumran community, I'm sure you've all heard of the Qumran community. You know what that is? No. So the Qumran community were a group of people that lived out near towards the Dead Sea. And that's where they found the scrolls in the caves of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they basically lived out there and, you know, um, they, they, they lived there and, at, until the temple was destroyed, actually, because the Roman Empire came through and wiped them out as well. And so this is where we get some of the some significant writings from there as well. So the Qumran community also drew no distinction between the author of Isaiah, of Isaiah 1 to 39 and 40 to 66. Um, and yeah, that's all I will read. So I thought that was interesting. You know, the, the apostolic community, the Qumran community were the same. They just thought, they believed that it was the same person that was running. All right. Uh, okay. So as I said before, there's a lot of messianic prophecies here. Um, and they mainly sit in the second half of the book, but that's not to say there's none in the first half of Isaiah because in Isaiah 11 we see, uh, I think it's the first couple of verses of Isaiah 11, the branch grown out of the root, the rod coming from the stem of Jesse. We all know that verse. You know, we will remember that one. We just know that the second half of Isaiah, it's just got even more weight um, with regards to a messianic prophecies. For example, Isaiah 53 talks about he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. We all know that, that uh, prophecy. 
In this second section of the book of Isaiah that we're focusing on, we see monotheism, this one God, open up more to the entire world. So we know in today's or this week's study of the Torah portion that it says in Deuteronomy 6.4 that Shema O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one, and there is only one God. And Pastor Kyle spoke on a really good message on that on Sunday at Kingdom Church, should you uh, like to listen to that. Uh, so jump on then to check it out. But it just, in the second part of Isaiah, it just is, it's elaborated more that it's not just exclusive. This one God is not just exclusive to the Jewish people. And we read through um, and see that he, uh, these prophecies are directed to Gentiles being promised access to the temple. That is the temple in the Messianic era. And for those that are Um, for those that obviously are joined with him, believe in Yeshua and um, his son. And so this is where we see the Gentiles burnt offerings being welcome. And that is referenced in Isaiah 56, 1 to 8, and Isaiah 66, 18 to 21. And the fact is we need to get this. We really need to get this sinking in because this is coming through the mouth of a man, Isaiah, but from God himself. And I just want to take one minute to just read one of these scriptures that pertains to the Gentiles because it's actually not listed as one of the readings in the remaining consolations over the next six weeks. So, Vanessa, I know you're super fast at finding verses because you've got um, an iPad there. Can you kindly look up Isaiah 56, 1 to 8? Thank you. And I'm just get you to quickly read through that. So Isaiah 56, verses 1 to 8. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my righteousness be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner who has drawn himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people and let not the eunuchs say, behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, to, who choose the things that pleases me and hold fast my covenant. I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than the sons and daughters and I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Is it to verse eight? Eight, thank you, yeah. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister him, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. The burnt offerings and the sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. Wonderful. I don't know about you, but how wonderful is that? Do you guys have any thoughts that you'd like to pull out from that just quickly, from that reading? It's like we Gentiles are grafted in. That's what I got from it. Yeah, that's good, Vanessa. Yeah, and verse 6, and the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord. But see, yeah, yeah. can I just say, please, uh, I've been, I've been thinking about this, you know, like God, like when you have, your, you might have a dozen children or something, you know, you might not be pleased. With some, but really God created us all and he loves us all. And we really, I suppose, we are his children. Yeah. And, and the grafted in sometimes I think, well, we're all God's, he loves us, you know, he wouldn't have made us. And yeah, I sometimes yeah. get over to get over that barrier. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, Glennis. And we have a free choice to choose him, don't we? Yeah. Sorry, Beth. Actually, Rabbi Gordon um, sort of touched on that this morning when mm-hmm. he was speaking about, you know, a man might have four different, four children. But each one of them, and he said, uh, you know, one of them might be a rebel. One of them might be um, one who, you know, loves the Lord and wants to learn more. And he just described 
four different types of children. And he really said exactly the same thing. You know, it doesn't matter what you're like, the, the, um, it's what, what you end up like that matters. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think, too, looking at it, <laughs> getting into theological argument here, but you preach, um, you but, preach but, but people say that God's, the Jewish people are his people. Yes, they are. But, and that brings divisions. Well, we're Gentiles. Why aren't we? We, you know, he put us into the Gentile line. He didn't put us into the other. Yeah. Yeah. Does he love us any less? No. He doesn't love us any less. But what I love here too, I don't know, Norma, did you have anything you wanted to add to this as well? Oh, I'm just wondering who the Gentiles were at that time. Who the Gentiles were at that time. Well, we've got to remember these prophecies are also... Sorry, you go. Go, Norma, sorry. No, I think I've said... No, it's because there wasn't much known about the outside world. Well, it's funny you say that. Yeah. Sorry. And... I just wonder why the Jews were his chosen people that he loved. Um, it, it seems a bit, a bit tough on the Gentiles, doesn't it? Well, we're all made in his image. Why did he choose a certain segment to, uh, to, to perhaps honour? Or um, why did he choose them? Yeah, well, and Does that's a good know? question. That's a really good question, Norma. I'll open that up to everyone. Why do you think God choose the Jews, the Jewish people? It's a bit like a mother choosing a favourite son. You can't do that. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. that's right. Obviously, they must have had his heart or something, or that some of the earlier ones did, and they just came from that part of the world, I guess. Mm-hmm. Beth, you had something to add? Well, I, I think it... It went back to Abraham and I think God saw something in Abraham. He saw the righteousness of Abraham. He saw the the fact that he left his uh, country of birth and was willing to travel and, you know, obviously started communing with the Lord. And I, I think it went back to there. And likewise, with all of us who are Gentile, everyone has a choice. And I don't think there would be anyone, especially in Australia, that hasn't heard about uh, Jesus. They probably don't really know who he is and what it is to uh, accept him. But I, I think we all have the chance of getting to know our Messiah. Yeah, you could say the same about the Jews too. They've got a choice mm, too. They have, yes. That's a good point. And I, mm. I, I agree with you. I agree with you, um, Beth. I was thinking right back to Abraham where God, if we look at the scripture back there, we just have to reread why did God chose, choose mm. Abraham? Because of his righteousness, mm. because he 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 went against the grain of what was happening in that pagan world at the time, and it was through mm. his seed that this all then was established. And of course, the Jews are the custodians. They eventually became the custodians, obviously, of the land, but of course, also of the word of God. But what I love about this, I mean, that was a really valid question to bring up, Norma. You know, it really is. And they're the questions that we all ask in our quiet times. And I just love it that you just, you have the boldness just to ask it. But what I love is that we are not separated from being um, uh, spiritually grafted into Israel. And, and that's what I think is so beautiful. And this was actually said ahead of time before even Messiah came. And the foreigners who joined themselves to the Lord, this was a prophetic um, mm. uh, word for those that will have, you know, then and, and in the future <laughs> join themselves to the Lord. Um, those who keep the Sabbath. Do you guys that have done all the Sabbath course, do you mm. remember that um, they focused on this? Mm-hmm. Yes. That's the importance of this is part of the importance why we keep the Sabbath and do, do not profane it. 
and but hold then, fast my covenant. Yes. But then, Kelly, you've got the Jews follow the Sabbath, but yeah. they don't believe in Jesus. That's true. That's true. It's I've always said this as I've been on this journey and studying all this, and I, I think I put it out the other night, Beth, you were with me. Yes. I, said, I feel like the, the Jews are here, the beautiful Jews are here with, say, the, um, the, their Bible, the Tanakh, and they go so far. And then we're like here in the New Testament and we only go so far. Mm. And there needs yes. to be this full, you know, crossing over. And this is why we're on this journey as Gentiles to, to learn to learn mm. all of this and um and of course we continue to pray for the jewish people as well so well i think that was a really good little verse to go through there it's um very encouraging <laughs> i shouldn't even say it's a little verse it's a powerful verse isn't it it's a powerful it verse and uh anyway all right so let's move on i'm not going to talk about isaiah too much michelle did a wonderful job last week and i have also uh spoken about isaiah a few times when we've done um tour, tour portion half to a portion studies but one thing i do want to say is given isaiah was a prophet um a lot of us uh christians uh, automatically think that a prophet is only about speaking the future and i would say that is one part of it the first and foremost role of a prophet is that they are a spokesperson for God. And this may come in the form of rebuke, which um, Michelle and myself had done, have covered the last few weeks. And even prior to that, we've said a lot. Um, or encouragement. It may come in the form of performance uh, prophecy like Ezekiel or comfort like we are reading today. And, you know, this may explain why there's this acute shift in the prophecy that Isaiah gives because he is literally being the spokesperson for God. And so if we look at these prophecies from that perspective, it might just shift how we read the prophetic books. And I know it has for me. And I think, I think of the Torah. Moses was a mouthpiece for God. And the key scripture to support this is Deuteronomy 18, 18, where it says, I will raise up from them a prophet like you from among his brothers, and I will put words in, um, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So Moses was a prophet and he spoke what the Lord commanded. And of course, this verse is also a prophecy to the ultimate prophet, which is Messiah. And he spoke what God intended him to speak. And you may remember that he spoke in authority and the people marveled at it. It was the word of God. And what I actually also find interesting, I wasn't going to say this, but if you look at Exodus 7, 1, we won't look at it right now, but do this in your own time. time. Remember when Moses was called to bring, um, to go into Egypt and bring the people, the children out of Egypt. Uh, Egypt and he said I, I I can't speak I can't speak to Pharaoh I'm not yeah and uh, and so this is when God said to Moses Aaron and it says it in this verse will be your prophet I will speak to you you will tell Aaron what to say and he was a prophet so it just confirms that it's giving that spoken word and prophetic words of the future is part of what God might be saying to that prophet anyway all right quick historical glimpse um, we know, obviously, we've just come from Isaiah rebuking the children um, in the previous chapters and calling for repentance. But he also, uh, we also see him talk talk about King Hezekiah's range, and we see that under King Hezekiah's leadership, that the kingdom of uh, Judah survived Sanhedrin, which is the Assyrian king, and he. Um, as he tried to attack Judah, but they survived. Now, I just want to note it was Sanherib, who was the Assyrian king that brought down the northern kingdom. So they brought down the northern kingdom and they tried to come at Judah, did the surrounding areas, but were not successful in Judah itself. So King Hezekiah also survives the sicknesses that after he pleaded to God uh, for the Lord to heal him. And he now makes friends with the Babylonian king and invites him 
into the kingdom to look at everything he has. You probably remember this. And of course, this is where Isaiah prophesies that Babylon will, um, will come in and wipe them out. And Hezekiah didn't seem too worried. You'll see it at the end of chapter 39 of Isaiah. He's like, that's okay. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be around then, so it'll be fine. <laughs> it's the weirdest, weirdest thing, but um, I love the, the, how the Bible relays it. And it was like now Isaiah, as we move into chapter 40, has moved into a time machine with the Lord and jumped ahead a couple of hundred years because this is where he picks up um, his prophecies. And it's after the temple's been destroyed and they are exiled in Babylon. And rather than rebukes, he starts to comfort them. All right. So the verse first, Isaiah 41, comfort, comfort, my people says your God. So I just want to quickly read from Zechariah 10, chapter 10, verse two. And this refers uh, to comfort in a slightly different way. Um, and I'll just quickly read this to you. Zechariah 10 2. For the idols utter nonsense and the div diviners see lies. They tell false dreams and give empty comfort. Therefore, the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted for a lack of a shepherd. So just keep this verse in the back of your mind. They have been given empty comfort from these idols. Like today, they wander like sheep, like today, and they are afflicted for lack of a shepherd. So on the first of Av, which fast of Av, which we talked about the 9th of August, um, the Jewish people, when they uh, go into the synagogue, they read from the book of Lamentations, which is Archa. The word Archa is Lamentations. And they, they read this book, excuse me, uh, at this time of the year. Does anyone know off the top of their head what Lamentations means? It doesn't mean sorrowful, mourning. Yeah, perfect. So the book of Lamentations was written by the prophet Jeremiah. And of course, it talks about, it laments the destruction of the temple and the exile afterward, the suffering the people felt. And it provides literally this visual picture of what it looked like, what it felt like. And the word lamentation comes from the root word konan, konen, sorry, konen, not konen, kon, konen. Quinen, <laughs> Q-O-N-E-N. -E there you go. <laughs> I can't tell you say it too well. And it's exactly what uh, Glenna said. It's a chant or a wail at a funeral, a lament, a mourning. And we see this a lot at the moment when we look at the news in the East, don't we, with the bombings happening and people dying. And the news, you, we see, you know, um, sadly, families picking up their um, deceased children carrying them in their arms and they're wailing. They're walking down the streets wailing. But here in the West, no, we have to be all in order. We don't tend to, to show that. It's like it's a bad thing to almost show that exp expression. But in the East, they, they definitely do. So it's fitting that they read this on this day at this time of the year. And although Lamentations was written after the Babylonian exile, the description is still relevant for those that would have, what they would have felt after the Roman Empire destroyed the second temple. So it has this duality to it. So a quick question for you guys. How many of you guys have actually studied Lamentations? Yeah, it's a, it's a little tricky one in there. <laughs> I must say, you know, uh, I admit I have been rereading it with a completely different lens on it this time. And uh, if you jump on YouTube and type in Lamentations Hebrew, there's actually one there. Um, this Hebrew man reads it out in Hebrew, but on the screen there's these beautiful pictures that are descriptive of the verses and it's also written in English. So you can read through it like that and get that full picture. So I just want to read Lamentations 1. Vanessa, do you mind grabbing that? Lamentations 1, 1 to 2, please. Um, and this will actually, because we've got some context behind it, will bring these verses to light. Unless Please. someone else, you got it? Yep, you're good. Okay. Sorry. Go, Vanessa. Oh, you Okay. Lamentations 1, 1 to 2.
Oh, I can't hear you. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, thanks. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow has she become? She who was great among the nations, she who was a princess among the provinces, has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemy. Lovely. So if we focus on verse 2, it says here, she has none to comfort her. And so I just want to pause a second and consider, I guess, the, the breadth and the bigness of this. And, of course, you know, this is a metaphor, a full expression of how God's chosen people felt, being described as a woman and is more than just being alone. And, you know, I was thinking about this and I was actually um, thinking about the story of Cinderella and how she was once, she was this, I know I'm not into, I'm not talking about the whole Disney side of stuff. I'm just talking about the story, how she once was a daughter to her father that um, sadly passed away in the story, but now she had turned into a slave to the mother-in-law and she was in that situation. You know, this princess, like it says in the scripture here, was once a princess, is now a slave. Her friends have dealt treacherously with her. So, you know, the feelings that she would have felt, being alone, isolated, who was there to comfort her? And, you know, and I also think about Job in the Bible. How would have he felt? with everything that he just, he got, you know. Um, but this situation is a bit different. We're talking about a whole people group, the Jewish people, not just one person, but imagine what that would have been like. They had been ordered to leave their homeland and now have to reside by the rivers of Chabar in um, Babylon and, you know, this foreign country with the foreign ways of doing things. And I wonder... What were they saying to each other? What were their body language? What was their body language like? And, uh, you know, how was their headspace? And, you know, what were the practical things like for them? And, you know, I just thought, I want to just open this up very quickly. Is, have any of you guys thought through this and or actually been through anything like this? Um, Kelly, it just says in my Bible that it's, it's got Judah's lovers. It's in verse 2. Yeah, uh, are the countries Egypt and Assyria, right? Yeah, yeah. A and that reminds me, they're all Abraham's children. <laughs> Go back they're to Abraham. All, so they're all related. Well, it's so funny you say this, Glennis, and I think I might have to send you something I'm watching at the moment of how the world popularised, how it grew, and it's literally showing you how people are all linking back to people. I need to send that to you because you <laughs> You're, you're talking about what I was watching last night. <laughs> Norma, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was thinking just then of the Jewish people in the Holocaust. Yeah. And how dreadful it must have been for them. And it sort of opened up so much to me as I was typing out those interviews. It yeah. must have been devastating for them, seeing their children either taken away from them or being shot in front of them. Yeah, it was just, and it would be another thing to do, you know, back in those years. Yeah, absolutely. And Norma, I was thinking about you because when you were in England, you were a child at the end of the first, second world war, weren't you? Were you displaced mm. at all or were you um, okay? Oh, we were okay. We were um evacuated to, to Yorkshire at the time, which seemed to have more planes shot down than back in London. But, uh, yes, we, as children, we went through it. It didn't mean as much to us as probably to our parents and yeah. my mother in particular because her husband was away and she had five children then. She had to go out to work and to worry about her children and what would happen during the day when the bombs came were being dropped. Yes, um, but as children, you didn't realise the seriousness of it as much as, you know, when you were older. It must have been so hard for them. Oh, absolutely. It, it made me think, I went straight to you because I know we've talked about it before. 
um, a little bit about it and I thought I wonder what that experience was like there. <laughs> so the people of Judah have gone through war, they've been exiled and now they're out of their place. They're out of the place they grew up, out of their comforts, out from where their family, uh, they, their relatives, a lot of their relatives possibly would have died because they've just come out of war. And the God's temple also had been destroyed. It was all gone. And, uh, you know, in verse 9 of Lamentation 1, it repeats these words again. She has no comforter. And so in your opinion, what happens to someone when they get comforted? What's your experience been? Yeah, Beth. Well, comfort helps to restore a person. So I would say there can be restoration. Yeah. When there's comfort. Yeah. Mm. Do you know, Kelly, also, I'll go back to the last um, the last little chat, if you don't mind. Of I was also thinking, you know, in the book of Revelation, we've been told what's going to happen in the time of the end. And I think if we're still around, um, each of us are going to have to make the personal choice. Do we fire the Lord? Do we fire the government? Yeah. And um, you can almost see just reading the news, watching what's going on, I almost feel like we're in the promised land and, and we're viewing the, um, the future of what, it will be like bef just before the kingdom. Mm. Mm. It's funny to say that because when you're saying about the, you know, like um, the book of Revelations and I was looking at, you know, comfort and how we can actually provide comfort to others because we can provide comfort if we've got the Christ, the hope and glory in us, can't we, in these particular times. And, you know, so just stepping on further on what you're saying, Beth, this is something that we should do. We've got uh, God as our leader, Christ as our leader, of course, as well, um, showing us how to do that. And in 2 Corinthians, I'm not going to read it for the sake of time, it talks about God is the God of all comfort. And it talks about how we should comfort those who are in affliction. And particularly in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, it talks about comforting each other in the day of the Lord because we know as it leads up, it's going to get even tougher and more challenging. And, uh, you know, and we may feel like a bit more and more that pressure of what the Jewish people felt like when they were, you know, leading up to exile, leading up to um, the Roman Empire taking over. There's so many beautiful verses in regards to comfort, but the two that I just want to focus on is the obvious one is Psalms 23.4, and I'm going to read it out. And I, don't, I hope you don't mind. It says, again, I'm conscious of time. But it says, even though I walk through the valley of the, valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You, you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So the rod and the staff that comforts is, you know, is from the shepherd. And the rod is the protection from the, pep um, the predators and the staff is the thing which guides the sheep. And um, when we talk about, I don't know if you guys have heard, I've spoken about this before, you know, um, in church about cast down sheep. Sometimes sheep turn on their back and they can't get back up and they actually die there. But if they didn't have the shepherd to, to bring them out of that position of death, um, then, you know, that, like I said, they would be left there to die. And the same is with God's people, isn't it? And the same is with us. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that verse in Zechariah 10.2 where these idols utter nonsense and the divin diviners see lies. They tell false dreams and give empty comfort. Therefore, the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted for a lack of a shepherd. And it only confirms after reading, you know, Psalms 23, 4, that God is the only satisfying comfort and God is the one that will lead us and them as a shepherd. Other comfort verses I wanted to read was in Psalms 119, 49 to 50, which it says, remember your word to your servant in which you have made me, which you have made me hope. This is my comfort in my affliction that your promise gives me life. 
So the root word here for promise is emir, which means speech or word. So you can imagine as the Jewish people started reading the Torah, but also the words, the prophecy from Isaiah 150 to 200 years earlier that he'd given at this time when they were in exile, it would have given them comfort. And this is how we comfort um, give comfort to others, isn't it? We pray with them. We point them to the word. And so this was the intention of God with these prophets, prophecies, that there, yes, there were these consequences for turning away from God. He said there would be if you did not keep my Torah. But we have to remember that God, he is just and he is a loving God. He is a loving father. So yes, there will be correction. But there will also be comfort. There will also be comfort, not only to them, but to us as well when we go through situations. Um, I was going to read you something from Midrash Rabah, um, but we, for the sake of time, I might skip through it. Um, but basically, the rabbis were just uh, pulling out the rebukes from, uh, from Jeremiah and um, contrasting it with the comfort from Isaiah. It's actually a really beautiful read, and it's from uh, Midrash Aika, Rabbah 123, if you want to go have a look at it yourself. So we know, who else do we know is the comforter in the Bible? I can see lips moving. Holy Spirit. Holy yes. Spirit. Yes. And Messiah, he promised it, didn't he, in John 14, 26, that when he leaved, the Holy Spirit would come. Um, you know, interesting in the Talmud Sanhedrin 98b, the rabbis were discussing what is, what is his name? In other words, they were, you know, saying, you know, what, what other words does Messiah's name also mean? For example, Prince of Peace, he's the good shepherd. And one rabbi piped up and said, he means comforter. And it's based on Lamentations 116, where it says, for these things I weep, for my eye, my eye overflows with water. I'm going to say that to Cam next time. My eyes are flowing with water. <laughs> it's when I'm crying. I thought it was such a beautiful way of saying it. I'm going to be my eyes, my eyes. I'm not trying to make light of it, but it's a beautiful way of saying it. Because it says after that, it says, because the comforter, who should restore my life is far from me. And so fast forwarding back into the Gospels, we see Messiah bring up comfort also in the Beatitudes, don't you? The blessings where he says in Matthew 5, 4, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And um, I know there are different thoughts on this chain of verses, but I just want to propose, could it be that Yeshua was like Isaiah, that he was foretelling the comfort that the Jewish people would need given the impending destruction of the second temple, along with, you know, all the other blessings that he outlined that, you know, they should set apart their life as um, a righteous life, regardless of what will happen in the future. But we do know that the temple will be rebuilt and Messiah will return to us, um, to, to, sorry, will return um, for us for eternity. Now, some of you may remember me mentioning Zechariah 8.19 a fortnight ago, and it was just, it's, it's the connection with why they do these fasts um, for the, the three weeks of rebuke. I just want to read it a second time and finish on this note with this, with regards to this section, uh, and take note at the back end of this verse. It talks about these fasts, that they will become feasts. And we will be cel and will be celebrated for what God will do in the Messianic era. So here it goes, Zechariah eight nineteen. Thus says the Lord of Hosts: the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth will become times of joy and gladness, cheerful feasts for the house of Judah. So love, true, and peace. So there's a few things, that, there's so much more just on this one verse I want to cover. Um, and, you know, the first one was just in regards to why did they say comfort trice? And um, I think I might just jump to that actually rather than going through the lead into that. Okay, so the comforts that we read in verse 1 from the Messianic perspective, the first comfort is the coming of the Messiah the first time, born of a woman 
bringing the good news and redemption. And of course, we see Messiah saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that is Matthew 4.17. The second coming, I'm sure you all know what that all is, is when Messiah comes the second time, bringing the second comfort, ushering in the final redemption to bring the messianic era. And one thing I just want to finish off just with regards to this verse, and I find this really interesting. I hope you do too. If not already, there's been lots of fun, um, exciting information. I know when I've been studying this particular portion this week, and that is the word comfort itself. It is the hum in Hebrew. And this is where Nehemiah um, his, gets his name, which means Yah who comforts. So something really interesting happened in Israel in the 1920s. Uh, but I just need to give you a really quick him history just to lead you up to this point. So, so we'll start from about 1517. From then to about 1917, the Ottoman Empire, which is the Turkish Empire, ruled Israel. And it was in 1917 that the British fought the Turkish and finally pushed them out. Now, you guys might have heard of the Australian soldiers in the Light Horse Brigade that Judge Glennis has shaken her head in Beersheba. Uh, well, this happened around October of 1917. Now, they captured Beersheba and enabled the British Empire forces to break the Ottoman line near Gaza in November and advance into Palestine and take over. So the Australian horsemen were part of that process of breaking in. Now, it was after this in 1917 that the British established the Balfour Declaration, which is the statement that says the British support um, the establishment um, in Palestine to be a national home for the Jewish people. So finally in 1920, three years later, the British appoint the first British High Commissioner to Palestine. Now remember that at this stage, Israel was not in, uh, recognised as the state of Israel until 1948. So the name of this first High Commissioner was Herbert Samuel, and he was, from, he was a Jew from England. Now we need to stop here and just think about again, the bigness of this. This is a big deal. He was the first Jewish ruler of Israel in 2,000 years. So you think about what we've been talking about. We're talking about the demise of the Roman, the, the second temple from the Roman Empire. From then to hit this time in 1920, no one had been ruling, um, you know, Israel, so to speak. So some might say, well, he was more British than Jew, but we need to think about people like Nehemiah and remember that, you know, he rebuilt the walls in Judah, but he was a cupbearer to the Persian king. And this was considered a high ranking role, a trusted role, because nothing could go to the lips of the king unless it was checked by this cupbearer. And that was his role. So essentially Herbert Samuel was seen as this later day Nehemiah. Nehemiah, sorry. So he comes to Israel within a week of arriving. He goes to the Herva synagogue located in the old city of Jerusalem. And this synagogue is the heart of the old, in the heart of the old Jewish um, quarter of Jerusalem. The people in the synagogue noticed who he was and he asked, was asked if he could read the Haftarah portion. And so he begins to read the Haftarah portion. So what portion do you think he read? This in the week that he came in 1920. I think you'll all get it. <laughs> it was today's portion. Today's, yeah. So, Vahakanan, so he started to read, Be comforted, be comforted, my people. So, just to grasp this, of all the prophecies, this is the timing this week falls on. And it was such a fitting read, I would say. And it shows you the breadth and the depth of God's word. You know, this Hafta reading has provided comfort when those who were in exile after the Babylon, after those that um, went through the Babylon conquest, it provided comfort when those who were in exile after the Roman conquest. It provided comfort when the first Jewish leader after 2,000 years got up and read these words of comfort to the people after going through 
another lot, another lot of persecution and war years earlier. And these words still provide comfort to those today that are in exile and those that are making aliyah to Israel. So imagine being in that audience, you as a Jew, and have been ruled for years under the Turkish regime and other empires, treated as a second-class citizen, and this literally was the case because that was the case under Muslim law. And then, you know, as a side note, the, one of the people that were also sitting in this place was a man called Eliezer ben Yehuda in the audience, uh, sorry, in the crowd there. And he was the man that petitioned to revive the Hebrew language in Israel, and that eventually happened. And so there is so much I would love to say, guys, but I thought what better way to end today's portion on something that, well, really happened about, what, 19, 100 and, well, 102 years ago. But, you know, we have seen just the changes that have been occurring in Israel, people making Ali, and, of course, it was declared as, as its own in 1948. And, you know, Messiah is coming back soon. So I say comfort, comfort. And that is how we're going to end today. I pray that that's been a blessing to you. It has been for me. I pray you have a fantastic week. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys in a fortnight. Bless you guys. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you, Kelly. Yeah. Good. God bless. Oh, yep. <laughs> Bye.